Hello and welcome to the Madison College presentation of How to Be Your Own Geek Squad. I am Leanne Cordisco and I'm your geek. I'm currently with Madison College, but before that I was with a medical device manufacturer for over 20 years where I was responsible for teaching engineers to install and fix network devices. So I've learned a few things along the way and I'm happy to share some tips and tricks with you so you can manage your home network, which might look something like this. On the right hand side, you'll see a collection of stuff that the Geek Squad is going to try to manage in a couple of different buckets. That first one being hardware, your physical devices, apples, PCs, iPhones, printers. The second bucket is applications. We'll focus on Zoom and WebEx today because those are top of mind for a lot of people. And lastly, the Geek Squad will look at Spectrum, wireless, wired, how the internet happens in your home network. So let's dive right in. Your network hardware, as I previously mentioned, could be PC versus Mac. It could be Android versus iPhone. Importantly, it can be company provided versus BYOD, bring your own device, with, which is raising in popularity these days. But your networking hardware also includes things like your monitor, your printer, your Bluetooth headset, your internet router, or your internet of things devices like your smart TV, your Amazon Echo, your Fitbit. There's a whole host of components that are on the network that's more than just a PC. So how would the Geek Squad manage this? First recommendation they would have would be to standardize, which is difficult, but the Geek Squad will say standardize on a hardware and application platform if you can. The reason for that is you would like to prevent changes in formatting between the platforms. You would like to prevent problems that come up from functions that only exist on one platform and not another. We have all seen occasions where formatting has changed if you've gone from Google Docs to Word, or if you've gone from an iPhone to a PC, it's just slightly different. So if you're lucky enough to have company provided hard, excuse me, company provided hardware, it's easy to get help because you've got an IT department for it. But when you're managing your own network, if it's standardized with hardware and apps that other people use, you can rely on your coworkers, your team members to be an informal IT squad, geek squad for you. So standardizing is certainly important. Perhaps more important is protecting. And there's a few things we can do here to protect our hardware. The first is to regularly cycle power on our devices. Why would we wanna do that? So that we can control when the software updates occur. Cycling power often will force software updates to happen. And if we can do that, we control when it occurs rather than having five having a, a meeting notice pop up and then within a minute of that meeting starting have another notice pop up saying we have to do a software update that can throw anyone into a panic so to try to minimize that as much as possible schedule power cycling of your devices once a week turn your computer off and turn it on that's all it means and that's enough to force those software updates do the same thing with your cell phone. Do the same thing with your printer every once in a while. Another thing to protect your home network equipment would be to update your antivirus software. This is super important. Antivirus software can only protect against viruses it knows. And how does it get to know a virus? Through software updates. So if there's a brand new virus that's sweeping the United States or the world and your antivirus software hasn't been updated, 
to notice this new virus, if this is the new virus, and our antivirus software knows about these viruses, this virus is going to stay, it's going to exist on your device and potentially cause a problem. So updating antiviruses and using firewalls that exist within your computer will go a long way towards keeping those bad actors or malicious software off of your device. Similar to cycling the power in your computer, you should be cycling the batteries on your computer. Why is this an issue? Well, batteries can form a memory. And all that means, well, let me explain it. What that means is that if you keep your laptop plugged in, except for one hour a day when you take it to lunch with you, your laptop power in your battery is probably sitting at about 100%. And then for that one hour when you go to lunch, that battery drops down to 80%. And you return from lunch, you plug the laptop back in, battery goes up to 100. The following day, you go to lunch, it drops down to 80. And your battery power cycles between 100% and 80%. That forms a memory within the battery. And the battery then uh, can't access that remaining 80% capacity. It lessens your battery life. And the way to prevent that is simply to drain that battery completely. So if you go to lunch one day and you return to, to your desk area, your office area, simply don't plug the laptop in. Let that battery deplete down to 10 or 15%. And that exercising the full range of that battery capacity will extend your battery life. So a great Geek Squad tip. In addition to that, you should still be performing physical backups of your data. Now, I know we all use cloud storage. It's free. It's easy. It's set up magically, and it seems like it's always there. However, if you lose your internet connectivity, you lose access to your backed up data. And that could be an issue if you're on deadline or if you've got a customer uh, question that needs to be answered, you want answers immediately, always go to your backed up physical data. That can be on an external hard drive, that can be on a thumb drive, data memory, is cheap right now and data is valuable. So in addition to your cloud backups, which I have a, a little bit of an issue with because of privacy and security concerns, which is a topic for another webinar with you, I do recommend an external physical hard copy, hard copy of your data. Now let's talk about applications. Your home network applications, primarily WebEx and Zoom for right now, uh, what I'm going to recommend is choosing a primary application and then choosing a secondary application. Why? Technology isn't perfect. And even if you take all the steps in backing up your hardware and maintaining your hardware correctly, Zoom can crash, WebEx can crash, something beyond your control can happen. And if you're in a very important meeting, having some kind of backup platform to continue your meeting is a best practice. So what I recommend is when you set up your primary in Zoom and invite your participants, set up a secondary, a secondary meeting in WebEx. Invite the same participants and communicate clearly that the WebEx meeting is a backup in case something fails with Zoom. I also recommend in your platforms learning where the default, defaults are and setting them for your preferences. I recommend turning my personal audio off and video off upon arrival into a meeting so that I can check to make sure that I sound good, that I look good, that I'm happy with it, and then I can join the meeting fully prepared. I also recommend turning off entry and exit sounds for participants. We've all been on meetings where there have been more than 10 participants joining over that first 
one to four minutes of our conference, and the entry and exit sounds are very distracting. So learning how to turn those off in defaults makes your meeting beginning a little more polished and professional. I also think it's a good practice, and the Geek Squad thinks it's a good practice, to learn where the important functions are within your application and figure out if they move if you're using more than one screen configuration, because they have, they do. An example of this would be the record button in WebEx. If uh, you're using a single screen, the record button for WebEx will be in two places, down at the bottom of the screen and up on the left-hand corner under the drop-down menu. If you share content and you're using two screens, the record button is at the top middle of the left-hand screen. So it can be confusing and a little frustrating if you're in a meeting and those buttons that you want to use have moved. So the Geek Squad is going to recommend making a cheat sheet. It could be screenshots, it could be bullet points, it could be anything you need to help you remember where these functions are, how to give someone else control, how to take control back, how to get yourself back to showing the right screen after you've moved away and given control to somebody else. So that comes down to practicing with your apps. Another best practice from the Geek Squad is knowing how to use these things. So set up a practice session with a coworker or a trusted friend or peer and use the record function, use the screen sharing function, give control to someone else, take control back, share documents, use chat, and make sure that anything that you could see in a live presentation, you've had at least one practice session beforehand it will be invaluable to your confidence and it'll make a dramatic increase or a positive impression in your, in your presentation. Lastly, choose your background wisely because you are on stage. You are a director. This is a production, not just a video conference. So the Geek Squad has some video conferencing app best practices. And it begins with you being the director and using your cell phone as a tool. So walk around your space with your cell phone camera in the selfie mode to find the best lighting. Stand near a window, stand near a door, move your camera around, find out where the shadows are, if half of your face is in shadow or if your nose is forcing a strange shadow across the side of your face and eliminate that. You can do that by standing near a window or you can do that by using the right kind of lighting. And the best kind of lighting would be soft lighting that is coming from behind the camera towards you. The worst kind of lighting would be a harsh lighting behind you going towards the camera. When you're backlit, you'll be very much in shadow. Top lighting down will give you some strange shadows as well. So an amazing tip is using that cell phone selfie mode to show you what your participants are going to see. Another great tip is to have your web camera, whether it's on your laptop or a separate device, slightly above eye level or equal to eye level. That will make you appear as if you're eye level with your participants in the call. It won't cast strange angles and it's just the best way to move forward. Join your video call again, only when you're comfortable with how you look. And so you have a little bit of time to play around with the angle of the camera to make sure you look good. Frame your shot, frame your presentation. What's behind you is part of your message. I happen to be using a splash screen behind me, which of course you can't see the room behind me, which is I think is a, a great feature. If you are going to show your room, your background, make sure it's tidy, make sure it's uncluttered, make sure it looks professional. No one wants to see 
unmade clothes on a bed. No one wants to see old pizza boxes. Also a note about presentation, stand when you can if you're presenting. You'll have better posture. You'll have a little more range of movement. So it'll come across, your meeting will come across as more humane, more human. And use a headset with a microphone. Don't rely on the built-in tools in your laptop. They're typically not the best quality. I'm using an external microphone now, and the sound quality is significantly better. Another tip is to close sensitive information that you don't want people to accidentally see. Your emails, your chat, sensitive Word documents or shared documents. So many times people have been embarrassed in meetings because something has shown up on the screen that just should not have been there. So a best practice is closing those windows. Now, if this is a lot to remember, it is. There is a tool online to help. If you Google YouTube how to improve your video calls in five minutes, you're going to see this wonderful young woman who is going to explain all of these tips along as, uh, uh, as well as providing additional ones. Now, I will have links to this video at the end of the presentation. So if you don't catch it now, no worries. You will certainly have it at the end of the presentation. Now let's talk about spectrum. Let's talk about how to move that internet signal into your house. And I'm going to point your attention to this slanted building on the center right-hand side of the display, which is the internet service provider. And to the right of the internet service provider, you're gonna see a building that's got a bunch of servers in it. Servers are nothing more than computers that have a tremendous capacity to process data and store data. So when you think about the cloud and where your data is, it's in these machines somewhere close to your internet service provider. Now to get that information to you from the internet service provider, if you follow the diagram from the right to the left, you'll see that there's some kind of wire, there's some kind of cable, some kind of attachment from the ISP through what look like telephone lines to your house on the left. And those wires connect to your house and inside your house, there would be a modem. The modem is an internet service provider owned device, and it's where the ISP ownership of the signal stops and your ownership of the signal starts. And it's important to know that in troubleshooting, because if you ask the ISP to try to solve an issue with an application that you own, they're not going to do it. So understanding ownership of where the signal ends and what the problem is, is an important, uh, important feature of being a Geek Squad person. And we'll dive into how the signal comes into your house so you can understand that next. Internet connection types. The wire that comes into your house that connects to the modem is usually one of three different kinds. The first is cable coaxial cable, like cable TV. That internet signal is transmitted over the cable lines from the cable company. This is reliable and it's slightly older technology and it's generally the slower type of internet connection that you can get. Why? Because cable internet shares bandwidth, it shares space on the internet superhighway with other neighbors near you who also have a cable connection. So if you happen to be in a neighborhood where many people have disconnected from cable and you're the only one still running it, you might have great speed. But if you're in a neighborhood where many people still have cable coming in, you might experience a slowdown just because of that type of connection. A newer type of connection is DSL, Digital Subscriber Line, I believe it stands for. And this signal comes from your telephone company over the telephone lines. 
and it's certainly more more popular than a cable connection because this bandwidth that capacity is not shared with your neighbors however the farther away you are from your internet service provider building the slower your speed is so if you're in a metropolitan area where you are close to some kind of isp service or provider your connection will likely be faster than if you lived in the country farther farther away from the isp where that internet connection would really slow down a newer faster version is fiber or fiber optics which are really cool flexible glass cables that move data at an impressive rate that connection type is more expensive it's not widely available now but it's coming and we can certainly expect to see that wide adoption of fiber i'd say within the next three to five years there's one other type of connection that i'd like to mention here but because there's no hard wire coming into the house i didn't put it on this slide and that's a satellite connection for those people who are out in the country who might not have that opportunity to have a cable connection or a dsl connection a satellite connection is nothing more than a satellite dish on the top of your house talking directly to another satellite and bringing internet service into you that way so once we understand that we've got the signal coming in probably through some kind of wire and it's through the cable line or the telephone line or a fiber line we know that that signal can be wired or wireless wired simply meaning that our computer is plugged into the modem with a cat5 or cat6 computer cable cat5 cat6 is just an industry name for computer cable not terribly important to know and what's more important to know is about the wireless connectivity in your house and it can happen in a lot of different ways so we're going to spend some time talking about it here we understand wi-fi as wireless but what you might not know and what geek squad people do know and really great detail is that there are two different frequency bands of wireless of wi-fi that you can have in your home the first is the 2.4 gigahertz speed or frequency the second is the 5 gigahertz speed or frequency the 2.4 gigahertz wi-fi which you'll see on the left hand side here um, connect connects a device to a router to a device the five gigahertz wi-fi network does the same thing we go from device to router to device and here's a picture of it the computer on the left hand side we have a 2.4 gigahertz network we can connect to we have a five gigahertz network we can connect to that happens in the router there's an echo there's a printer that both are connected to the router as well and when we want to send a document to the printer this computer will connect over the wi-fi network send that signal to the router and the router sends the signal to the printer so if you can't print it could be because the router is not working you'll also notice in this image the computer speaks on this 2.4 gigahertz network the computer speaks or can connect to the 5 gigahertz network please also notice that this echo has a blue and a green line representing the 2.4 gigahertz network and the 5 gigahertz network so this computer can connect through the router to the echo on the 2.4 network the computer can connect through the router to the echo on the five gigahertz network many printers only print on the 2.4 gigahertz network so you'll see the computer connects to the router on the 2.4 network and then speaks with the printer if your computer was connected to the five gigahertz network in the router 
you would not be able to print to the printer because they're not on the same network. So the Geek Squad says a great troubleshooting tool is to know what network you are on and know what network your devices are on because it might be different. How do you know which network you are on? On your device, simply click on your wireless icon and you'll see the names of all the different wireless networks you can join. If your wireless router has the 2.4, network and the 5G network available, you can connect to one of those networks there. I also want to take a moment here to say that the 5 gigahertz network of Wi-Fi is different from 5G cellular. 5G cellular just means fifth generation of technology. It doesn't refer to frequencies or rules or protocols for Wi-Fi at all. 5G just means is the fifth big change, the fifth big rollout of new stuff in cellular connectivity. So another thing I'd like to point out about Wi-Fi is that the 2.4 gigahertz network can typically push a signal out farther. It's got a longer range, but the trade-off is you'll get a slightly slower speed. The five gigahertz network means, well, the five, giga, five gigahertz network will provide to you a slightly shorter range, but give you higher speed. Why this is important to understand is depending on the physical layout of your house. Think about maybe an 1100 square foot condo with an open floor plan. You won't need to go through many walls or floors to get a full coverage area. In that case, a five gigahertz network might be better for you, shorter range, higher speed. But if you have an old, say, three story house and your router is on the first floor and your office is on the third floor, you might need that 2.4 gigahertz network because that longer coverage area, that longer range gets you the access you need. The trade-off is a slower speed. So that's Wi-Fi in your house, two different frequency speeds. Here's another medium in your house, Bluetooth. And where Wi-Fi connects device to router to device, Bluetooth connects device to device. You don't have to have a wireless router anywhere near you to connect using Bluetooth, that's its purpose. So in this case, I've got a cell phone connecting directly to the Echo. I've got a cell phone directly connecting to the printer using Bluetooth. So from the Geek Squad perspective, if we can't print, now we have to consider, are we on the right Wi-Fi network or are we connected using Bluetooth? And if we're connecting, Using Bluetooth, perhaps your cell phone's Bluetooth signal has been accidentally turned off. And that could explain why you can't print. So device to device with Bluetooth, device to router to device with Wi-Fi. Another way to connect wirelessly in your house is cellular. And in this case, how cellular works, primarily for the majority of phone calls made, it's phone call to cell tower to phone. So there is something that stands in between the two phones, all that cellular technology that we're just going to condense into something called cell tower. And that's how most cell phones connect, phone to cell tower to phone. But smartphones are smart enough to know that if they don't have a good enough cellular connection, especially within, say, an old office building, they figured out a way to provide an extra step to get you better signal, get you better connection. And that is called Wi-Fi calling. And how that works, it goes cell phone to your Wi-Fi router, to the cell tower, to another cell phone. So it's using Wi-Fi to help get that 
phone call through. And again, all of this can exist within your house. You'll know that you're using Wi-Fi calling because you'll see a little Wi-Fi calling icon at the top of your phone. So if you are using the 2.4 gigahertz network for Wi-Fi, we've already said you could see some slow speeds because of it. There is a way that we can improve speed on the 2.4 gigahertz network. And this only works for the 2.4 gigahertz network. It's called changing the channel. A dirty little secret that Geek Squad people know that most people, most other people don't know, is that routers come out of the box set to a default channel of six. Within the 2.4 gigahertz world, you can think of having, a, let me make this analogy for you. Let's say there's a highway with two lanes on it. The driving lane and the passing lane. The driving lane is congested, moves along at a regular pace, kind of slowly. The passing lane has fewer cars in it and you can move faster. Think of the entire potential of the 2.4 gigahertz network of have, as having a highway with 11 lanes on it. 11 different channels, 11 different lanes. Wireless routers come with a default, uh, come set up with a default channel of six primarily being used. And most people don't change that channel. So what's happening is if a bunch of people are using that 2.4 gigahertz network around them, they're all in the same lane. They're all in that channel number six. And what you can do is go in and say, oh, put me on channel seven or eight or nine or 10 or 11. Anything other than that default channel of six and it's going to improve your wireless speed for free, which is great. Now you're thinking, I don't know how to do that. Well, that's okay because there is a video out there to help you do it. No matter what router you have, no matter what generation it is, I'm betting dollars for donuts that you can go online and find a video that will walk you how to do that step by step. I'm showing an example of a Netgear Genie here. If you Google how to change your Wi-Fi channel and avoid neighbor interference, you'll get a video that shows you this configuration page and how to actually make that channel change. Here's something else the Geek Squad knows. You can't break these devices easily. You know, if you drop it, it certainly can break. But from a configuration perspective, not so much. Think of these wireless routers, almost like Etch-a-Sketch. And if you build a configuration on it that you don't like, you hit reset and it melts it all away. Just like if you put a picture onto the Etch-a-Sketch that you don't like, give it a shake and it melts all away and it's ready to use again. So all these connectivity devices have reset buttons on the back. And if you build a configuration that doesn't work, reset it to factory def defaults and then you're back in business. So only for the 2.4 gigahertz network, you can get off of the slow lane, which is six, get onto a different lane and get free speed performance uh, improvements. Kind of neat. Another way to improve, or in many cases in an emergency, get you out of a jam, improve some wireless signals, Two different ways. You can use your cell phone as that wireless device to get you to the internet. So if you use your cell phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot, you allow other devices to connect to the inter internet by sharing your phone's cellular connection. Now, Wi-Fi sharing is a little bit different. Other devices, can connect to the internet using your phone's Wi-Fi connection. So if you're in a coffee shop, you can have a friend get onto your cell phone's Wi-Fi connection if you're using Wi-Fi calling and provide internet signal for them. How this has been useful for me is 
in an emergency situation, as I mentioned, I always set up mobile hotspots on my phone when I first get my device. Set it up so it's ready to go, and then when I need it, it's there. If you're wondering how to set up the mobile hotspot and Wi-Fi sharing, there's a fantastic video you can go see. If you Google YouTube, how to set up mobile hotspots for iPhone and Android T-Mobile, you'll see this young lady in a two or three minute video showing you the configuration steps to set up the mobile hotspot on an iPhone and an Android. So excellent Geek Squad tips for other ways to connect to the internet if you're having problems. So let's go back to this idea of using the 2.4 gigahertz versus the 5 gigahertz network in your house. And depending on how your house is laid out, what's going to work best for you. So let's talk about how to improve wireless in your home. If you look at the ground floor in the middle room, the living room, I've got a little wireless router there. And that's where the connection is coming in from the outside from the internet service provider. And that router, as it's pushing signal out everywhere, it does a great job on covering the first floor and much of the second floor. It even reaches out through a window and a door, and you can get wireless signal in your backyard. But it doesn't do a great job at getting up to the third floor, where that home office is in that spare room. So there are a few different ways you can improve wireless signal in your house. First is, as we talked about, using the 2.4 gigahertz network rather than the 5 gigahertz network, and possibly you'll get the coverage area you need. The second way, and this is, I think, in the Geek Squad things, the preferred way, although it's a little bit more expensive, it is more expensive, it's changing your networking hardware to a mesh network. And what does that mean? Well, if you take a look at the third floor now, you'll see that there's another little router there, and you'll see this yellow bubble that represents the additional coverage area that you're getting. So a mesh network is taking at least two, possibly more radios and putting them on this little mesh network. If you think of a mesh bag, you can kind of see it inter, uh, intertwined and um, yeah, intertwined. Um, so a mesh network is doing the same thing, taking at least two different si signals, intertwining them, getting better coverage area. Now, this is a two or $300 solution because it means replacing that wireless router. It means adding this mesh network technology, but it's significant in how much better your signal reception can be. If you didn't want to go the route of a mesh network, the third option for improving wireless in your house is simply to buy a wireless extender. And a wireless extender acts very similarly to a mesh network um, where you're adding a second device that's going to communicate with your primary wireless router. But often those two devices will be from separate manufacturers, and it's a good stopgap measure, but it doesn't provide the seamless and better coverage of a mesh network setting. So three different ways to improve wireless in your house. So now that we've got wireless in there, and we know that we're using one of two different kinds of Wi-Fi, how can we check that it's working the way it should? Well, what I'm going to recommend is down in the bottom left-hand corner here, it's going to say uh, perform a speed test at speedtest.net. So if you go to speedtest.net, what you're going to see is a screen, a black screen with a big red, uh, excuse me, yellow circle in the middle that says go or start. And all you need to do is click that button and 10 seconds later, the test is done and the results are displayed for you. I've got two different results of two different speed tests here on the screen. If you take a look at the right-hand side of the screen, 
the upper blue box is wired. That's where I had a computer cable connected to my router. The bottom green box says wireless. And as you can imagine, that's when I was using Wi-Fi. Look at the difference in the speeds. When I was wired, I had 818 megabits per second available to me. When I was wireless, I had 256 megabits per second available to me. The wired connection is almost three times faster. And that might not be the same for your location, but I can just about guarantee you will see a speed increase when you're running a wired network rather than a wireless network. So the Geek Squad will say whenever possible, and whenever you, you're uploading or downloading large amounts of data, use a wired connection. What else can you do? If you have a cable network, I've got a picture of a modem in the middle of the screen, and it's got its cable connection coming into the back of it. Make sure that connection is tight. If you're having intermittent problems and you've had this system for a while, believe it or not, motion in your house can cause this connection to loosen a little bit. If you're on a busy street, the vibration from the cars and buses can cause this cable to loosen over time. It sounds strange, but it's true. And tightening down that connection can improve your internet performance. Another great Geek Squad tip is making sure your network hardware, the router, the modem, have good airflow around them. Make sure that their air vents aren't blocked with lint or pet fur or anything like that. Make sure they're not suffocating in the bottom of a cabinet somewhere or behind uh, a big cabinet. These devices, since they're on all the time, can overheat. And when they overheat, they'll shut down and reboot. And it's just a way that they can try to cool themselves off. And you can eliminate intermittent problems by making sure that there's good airflow around these networking devices. Get them up high if you can. Um, well, I should say, get them out into the open if you can. And uh, for the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz signals, they actually prefer to be lower in the room. So the best placement for these devices will be out in the open, on the floor, but not where they can get damaged. So something else I'd like to point out to you about checking your network and about using speedtest.net is um, you need to know what your ISP has promised you in their service contract to know if you have an issue or not. Let me say that a different way. You signed up with an ISP and they're guaranteeing you 300 megs download. And you go to speedtest.net and every day you do this test and it's 250, 240, 180, 230. And it never hits that 300 download speed that they're guaranteeing to you. Call the ISP and tell them that. And here's another dirty little secret from the Geek Squad. Most ISP modems, that hardware that they own, have a usable lifespan of about two years before they just start to act a little wonky or slow down. So, if you see that you're not getting the speed that you're contractually obligated to get, ask the ISP to look at their modem and replace it as necessary. And that can also improve your speed and performance. Okay, so we're coming up to the end of our presentation, I'd like to summarize what we talked about. What would the Geek Squad do? For hardware, they're going to say standardize and protect. Standardize and protect. The protection comes in cycling power to push software updates, making sure there's good airflow around your networking hardware, that router, that modem, so they don't overheat and uh, drop off of the network. Make sure that you've got an external backup 
protect that data so we can't get to the internet, we still have what you need. And if you have an issue, Geek Squad's number one action is to Google the problem. If they don't know exactly what the problem is immediately by listening to you, if they're a little stumped, the first thing you're going to do is Google the problem. And you can do that too. Don't be afraid. You're not going to break it. Worst case scenario, you'll just reset some weird configurations. For applications, standardize. Standardize if you can. If you can't have a backup, uh, excuse me, if you can't standardize because you're using a BYOD system, bring your own device system, then it's great to have uh, plans, best practices in place like having a backup application. So don't always rely on WebEx because if WebEx goes down, you know you can jump over to Zoom as another application. Make sure you change your defaults so that there's no interruptions in the beginning of your meeting. Have a cheat sheet for all that important function is. Don't forget about creating a home studio so that you have a polished professional look. And if you have issues with applications, Google them. <laughs> it works for, for applications and spectrum, spectrum stuff as well. Here's a great tip that I didn't point out early in the presentation. When it comes to your home network and all that stuff, the computers, the printers, monitors, the routers, the Internet of Things components, draw and label the network. So you've got a line coming from your wall that's going to the modem. Draw that on a piece of paper that what connects to what that what connects to what that comes into and that goes out to is a time-honored troubleshooting tool for Geek Squads, knowing how components should be laid out. Super important. It's a great idea to label your cables. In many cases, it's confusing if you've got three or four computer cables going into the back of a device some of those ports on the back of the internet device might be yellow, some might be white, some might be blue. You, just because the cable fits doesn't mean it's the right connection for it to go to. So always draw and label the connections and where it goes to so that you can easily replace a device if, if you need to. Also, when you're talking to your ISP, if you have a problem that you're troubleshooting, if you can say, I know that I've got my signal coming into the modem because it's connected on jack number two, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Um, another thing you should be doing when drawing the network, and labeling your network, is on the modem, have the 800 number, the tech support number of the internet service provider, have the username and the password of that device have the serial number information easily accessible because that's the information that they'll be asking from you. And it will be so much easier to just retrieve it from the modem, you've got a piece of paper taped on it or a piece of tape on it with that information. Uh, Geek Squad does that all the time, label and name and draw. Okay, keep good airflow around the modems and the routers. Don't let them overheat. Know what kind of wireless signal you're using. Is it wireless? Is it Bluetooth? Is it cell phone? The wireless signal has to go through a router to get to another device. The Bluetooth signal goes from device to device. The cell phone signal goes from cell phone to cell tower to device. If you're on the 2.4 gigahertz network, Try changing your default off of channel number six to improve your speed. That's free, and you can Google how to do that. Use speed test to make sure you're getting the bandwidth that you're supposed to be getting. Having facts at your fingertips when you're talking to your ISP is always a great idea. If you can, use the five gigahertz capability within that wireless router because you'll get faster speeds but you won't get that uh, extended coverage area that we talked about. If you don't have great coverage, update to a wireless mesh network. And lastly, 
Google your problems. So thank you very much for taking the time to watch this webinar from Madison College on how to be your own geek squad. Hopefully you'll find this information useful. Hopefully if you enjoyed this presentation, you would consider looking to Madison College for some additional presentations. Go to our website and check out our webinars. We're constantly providing free webinars on this new workplace in the COVID environment, leadership, development, personal enrichment. We're here to be your source of adult learning. And it's been my pleasure to be with you here today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.